Okay, Tom, thank you for this opportunity to come talk to all you guys. Um, I never get this chance to have the whole of the theory explained by someone who's <laughs> known it for decades and articulates it so well. So I feel like I should be able to kind of carry on from where Rick left off and explain largely some of the research and the applications of, of what Rick's uh, been talking about. Um, I am maybe controversially going to situate it in the, in the scheme of cybernetics. I'm going to make a case that this, this simple idea that is still obviously controversial, that we control our input, not our out output, and that we do that automatically, has huge implications. And I'm going to share with you some research that we've done in our own group going from robotics through to exposure therapy through to conversational therapy. Okay? Um, so, you know, I, as soon as I came across powers, I read more about cybernetics. And I was deeply impressed by what cybernetics had produced, especially in the emergence of it putting purpose at the heart of behavior, building machines to test principles like Ross Ashby did, spearheading interdisciplinary research, getting groups of completely different disciplines, just like today, all working together and using those approaches very broadly, inspiring a whole field of psychology, the cognitive psychology and information processing approach, and underpinning what became, in my field, psychology, the self-regulatory approach. All of these things well, differ in accuracy, but they all uh, reference cybernetics as a key uh, influence. But zooming up to 2019, have things really changed despite these apparent advances? Very, there's a lot of inter interdisciplinary schemes, but very few of them actually use a unified interdisciplinary theory. There's been lots of um, imaginations about how robotics and artificial intelligence will advance, there's been a real ceiling to those advances. When I go back to my department of psychology, people talk about stimulus and responses as though this is how we should actually see the world, despite all of these decades of advance. There are unrelenting rates of mental health problems in our society. Our society is in conflict. My country is in conflict um, over joining Europe. It's a mess. And why has this happened? And I actually believe that one of the reasons that this has happened is because we don't understand other people's behavior. Because we place this primacy on the observer's perspective of behavior. And Rick's been explained to you that you cannot fully understand behavior if you take the observer's perspective. You have to take the perspective of the behaving individual or organism or machine. So, let's see how well you've been uh, concentrating on, on Rick's talk. I'm going to show you a video, and I want you to think, work out what the person on the left of this video was instructed to do. The person on the right is me as an experimenter. They've both got pens in their hands, okay? And their movements are going to be recorded by a pen on the page, okay? And your job is to work out what was that person on the left told to do. Okay. Who wants to put their hand up and make a first guess? Oh, there's so many people. You know we're going to do this for students. It's like the occasional hands. <laughs> who's who's really who's really confident? What do you think? Well, I'm not going to say I'm really Oh, okay. What do you think? What was the person on the left told to do? Okay, anybody else think that was what, the, what their person on the left was told to do? Maintain a constant tension while trying to draw something. A few people, a few people, yeah, yeah. 
Unfortunately, that's not correct. OK, OK, next one. Next one. Yeah. Keep the dish not over the spot. OK, who else thought it was to keep the knot over the dot? Put your hand right up if you thought it was to put the knot over the dot. You guys, four of you, are correct. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts about what the person on the left was told to do if you're willing to admit it? Yeah. Copy the right hand. Copy the right hand drawing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah copy, so copy. The mirror the other person. Yeah, yeah do the other. Anticipate what the other person's going to do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and this is exactly what we get in the data when we do this study. This is a study, we, we replicated it uh, four times, uh, where we show people this video and ask them to tell us uh, what that person on the left was doing. And, yeah, a lot of people said draw something, do the opposite, copy, various other different things, like draw two boxing kangaroos was one example. <laughs> A tiny, well, how many, who got it right? I think nobody got it read right in study one, and I think when we did it, this on Facebook, I think we had a few more academics doing it. We got about 5% got it right. Okay? Very few participants were correct, unlike the four of you geniuses who worked it out that the person was trying to keep the knot over the dot. We did a computer model with Rick's help, and he showed that this task is very well uh, emulated through a PCT model. Because what you do is you have a reference point, which is the knot over the dot, and you compare the knot on top of the dot to the distance that it currently is, okay? And that error, that difference, drives your output to move the, the pen so that dynamically you keep the knot over the dot. Let's just, for those of you who might have missed that knot and the dot, can you see it there? The, the, dot, the knot's in the middle and the dot's there. Can you see how close that has been kept to the dot in the middle? Yeah? yeah? But we don't notice that. We get distracted by the behaviour, by the, the sipping of the tea. And we think, oh, that must be what they wanted to do. But they were not. That was not what they were told to do. They were told to keep the knot over the dot. And, and they get better. And they get a bit better, yeah. yeah. And perceptual control theory, that might be reorganisation. Perceptual control theory is about keeping knots over dots, okay? At well, various levels. Who Can I just carry on, and then we'll have a big discussion at, at the end. Um, okay, so um, what we're showing here is that when people observe things, just like most of us and like most of our colleagues, and you look at behaviour, it looks like it's controlled output. In this example, we know it's controlled input. Yeah, The person's controlling their perception of the knot over the dot. We've built a model to show that's the case. And yet, to 95% of people it looks like something completely different. This observer perspective on behaviour has the capacity to be very misleading in terms of helping us understand what's really going on in behaviour. And um, Bill Powers thought this might be the case, partly because when uh, Norbert Weiner and control engineers have tried to use it in psychology, have done so ever since, they tended to think that the goal is set on the outside of the machine or the person. But as obviously as Rick's been saying, VCT says we set our own goals. It's inside your brain. And we don't know, you can't see that. It's inside someone's brain. You've got to use some more complex methods to work it out. Uh, this is uh, an elaboration um, of um, what Rick has been explaining. And there's that reference signal inside, inside your heads. Uh, I have a reference signal that's been relevant to me um, for this conference. Been here nearly 10 days now, and I generally like to see my wife and my both my sons every day and get very close to them. And I've not been able to do that, mm -hmm. and so I've tried to close that loop through other ways, sending them texts, talking to them on face on FaceTime and and stuff like that. That's that's one sort of really important reference value for me, and I'm sure you guys have got ones that you organise your life around as well. So, so, so working from up to something like that, relationships, let's start back at the basics again. And, and Rick did a, um, a fabulous piece of work a few years ago where he, wanted, he planned to build a model to try and understand how fielders in baseball or cricket um, get to the ball to catch it, okay? And there are lots of models of this going around, but they're generally based on the classic kind of 
controlling output prediction um, approach. And the predictive mind is very popular in psychology at the moment. And the, the, their kind of explanation goes something like this. The appropriate memory of this is recalled by the sight of the ball. That memory triggers a temporal sequence of muscle commands automatically. That memory is adjusted to the actual pass of the ball, and you get in the right place. That's the kind of standard um, approach. But like Rick was saying, how do the muscle commands used in one context, how are they appropriate to another context? There's huge variations in conditions across, uh, across situations on the ground, um, in terms of uh, the air, the wind, etc. Um, and so, and also, I've always wondered how does if if our mind predicts, how does it decide what time frame to make predictions? Is it within a microsecond, a second, three seconds, five seconds, ten seconds? Is it doing all of those at once? It just seems really labour intensive. Um, and so, Rick used a methodology called testing the specimens where you propose a theoretical explanation, you build a model, um, either mathematical or computer, and you compare the behavior of the model against the real data. Okay? And this is Rick's model of catching a baseball. And he's, uh, he simplified it into two uh, control systems. One that controls your, that uses your lateral movements to keep the, your perception of the ball on your retina in the center of your visual field, okay? And a second control unit um, that actually is, is, its goal is to keep the uh, velocity of the, um, the, the image of the ball on your retina going up at a constant rate, okay? Neither of these models have any physical model of reality in them, and they're purely uh, around the, the catcher's, the fielder's perspectives. There is no kind of observer telling them where the ball is. And when you do this model, and this is one of uh, Rick's simulations on his, uh, on his mind reading site, on the left, that's the, that is the observer's perspective. Okay? The ball gets thrown up in the air, and then the uh, fielder on the right has to get to the right place to catch it. On the top right is the retina of the computer simulation. That's what the computer can see. Uh, for itself, which is uh, conforming to, to keeping this perception controlled. And then at the bottom right there, you see the varying behaviours. Every time the behaviour is different to achieve that same goal. So it's a really nice kind of everyday example of, um, of control. And um, Rick also very helpfully talked about hierarchies. He talked about the idea that when we, send, when we have a, a high-level goal, like wanting to be with your family or wanting to be understood in a lecture, you don't just trigger behaviours automatically. You send out signals, commands for what you want to experience, the perceptual results of your actions. So anything we tell our bodies to do are not literal motor commands. They're actually goals for how we want to perceive things uh, that are coming into our senses. And uh, Rick already elaborated on, on this, but the remarkable thing about Bill Powers <laughs> is he spent half his life introspecting on what these levels of perception might be. And he used method of levels, which we use, now use as a therapeutic approach, to aid this introspection and to start to break down these increasingly abstract, um, non-commensurate uh, levels of perception going from the concrete ones to increasingly more abstract ones. And I won't, you know, this is something that if anyone's interested, they can contact me, and I hope to put this talk up for people to, to use. But again, maybe we're just obsessed with tea and coffee, but the example is, is drinking coffee here. But it's, it's being much more detailed about the different levels that would actually be involved uh, to be doing this. But what I want to do, I want to go and focus on, on data now, okay, on our own data from our own group. Um, Bill was interested in, in robotics. He wrote four key articles in 79 about this. Um, and as Rick was suggesting, this actually, if you use this theory for robots, they could be very different looking to the ones that are, are around. And, uh, for example, a colleague in East Anglia, Rick Kenaway, has shown some simulations of these. Uh, one of which is the inverted pendulum, which I'll share with you. And then a colleague of mine, Rupert Young, has got a whole... He, just, he builds his stuff, shows the robots on YouTube, and 
kind of pushes forward perceptual robots, he calls it. Um, I'm going to share a study with you with our engineering department where we wanted to directly pitch a PCT controller software against the best of uh, control engineering software in operating the same robot. Okay? So the inverted pendulum is, is quite simple. It's a, a, um, a cart or a movable set of wheels on a surface that has a weight at the top uh, connected by a fixed solid rod and its goal is to um, get that, that bob at the top at a, at a uh, chosen location and so when that location moves it needs to go over to that place but in doing so it has to keep the, um, the bob on the top so it doesn't uh, fall over. This is the model that uh, was inspired by Bill and Rick Kenaway and our master's students reproduced. It's a hierarchical model of balance, okay? I won't go into the exact details, but it, the only reference point that's external or told to it is right at the top, where it just basically you tell this thing where you want the bob to go, okay? And then everything else, all its other goals, it works out for itself in terms of what velocity it needs to go in what direction. And each of those is set in a cascading way um, that uh, Rick described in terms of the hierarchy, okay? That was very different, interestingly, from the two other uh, models, um, one of which had four reference, four goals that you had to set from the outside, whereas the PCT one works, worked out all of these things for itself dynamically. Uh, so what do we do? We built the, the controller, we optimised it uh, in a simulation and then optimised it within a robot and compared it to um, other controllers. This is the robot, it's made of Lego, Lego Mindstorms. Um, and as you can see, you get a measure here of angular displacement, which you want to keep at zero, keep it at the top. And then you also want to keep it roughly um, uh, focused on the same location as well. And Thomas, who run this in real life, had a, a special little unit where there's cameras in the corner, 12 cameras that can have millimetre accuracy to, to record where it's gone. And there were lots of findings of this, but essentially what we found is that the PCT robot had a lower steady state error uh, than the other robots. As, you know, like Rick was saying, those signals are, can be pretty uh, minor and the accuracy can be pretty strong. Um, it, uh, it tracked really well and it tracked significantly better than the other two. So the red one, or the or red orange in the middle is a PCT. The blue one is a standard proportionate controller, negative feedback proportionate control. The other one is called a least, oh no, sorry, a linear quadratic regulator, which is quite a contemporary control engineering method. And what we find is the PCT robot has much better control against the others. It, it, it uh, corrected itself from disturbances, up, knocking it up to 15 centimetres from its goal um, and got back to balancing again. Um, and it could move to a new point. The other two couldn't even move to a point that you set it. So there was something qualitatively different that this robot was doing from the other ones. Okay, let's leave that there. Let's go a little bit more uh, kind of physical with this, but we're going to go into the psychological domain, okay? And we're going to look at conflict, and we're going to look at control of distance, but we're going to look at it for something quite personally important, a phobia, okay? The standard model of phobia, still in my colleagues' journals, is the idea that something we're scared of is a stimulus, okay? <coughs> that it, it triggers either an avoidance response or it triggers an approach response, okay? Now, that's not the way we see it from a PCT perspective. What we see is there's something in, out there in the world, in this case, a spider, and the person has a perception or a, a, des a, a desired perception of how near or far they want that thing they're scared of to be, okay? And I don't know about you, but most of the people I know with phobias are in a conflict. On the one hand, they want to get as far away from this thing as possible because they think it's going to harm them, it's going to, they're going to have a panic attack, so they have a, a very far uh, reference point for it. But on the other hand, especially people coming for treatment, they want to get nearer because they know I can go into the shed at the bottom of the garden now, or I can sleep at night, or I can use the shower, or I can be a strong person for the rest of my family. Okay? So they're actually in conflict, and that's, the, that's how conflict's defined in PCT. 
having opposing reference points, opposing goals for the same variable. Okay? So now, if we understand that, how are we going to do exposure therapy and how are we going to test if that is true, if it's all about control? Okay. The, the standard theory is that you have to hab habituate to a threatening stimuli to loosen that stimulus response association. Um, and often it, that says nothing about the how the therapist should control or not control the situation. You know, should they encourage them? Should they reward them? Should they persuade them, explain it to them, etc., etc.? There's nothing in that theory that tells you what to do as a therapist, okay? Maybe, just maybe, what you're really trying to do is facilitate client control. You'd want to get them to establish a new equilibrium distance that resolves that conflict and it's the location that they actually want to be from that fearful thing. So how are we going to test that? Okay, um, We're going to give people a chance to tell us why they, we're going to get their awareness up to what their goals are about why they want to avoid that thing and also why they want to get near, near it. So we're going to help them be fully informed of the control that they may or may not be using in the experiment. And then we're going to do a study where we manipulate how much control they actually have over the exposure. Okay? Um, so we did a study on a computer screen where you have a, a joystick, and we've got people who are afraid of spiders, and we gave them this, uh, this task and gave them the impression that they'd be able to control how close they were to this moving spider on the screen. Okay? In actual fact, we'd yoked them in pairs. They didn't know about this. Half of them could control that distance, okay? And half of them got the exposure distances that the, num that the first person had got, so they got exactly the same exposure, but they weren't in control of it, okay? So if exposure therapy is about exposure, there shouldn't be any difference between these two groups. But if it's about control, then there should be a big difference, okay? And we get a divergent pattern. The people who were in control of that exposure, go closer to a spider having done this task, whereas the ones that got exactly the same exposure but weren't in control of it tend to, to avoid it more. And we followed them up in two weeks, and we get the same pattern. We're just doing, working, doing this now in two dimensions in virtual reality to see if it, it replicates. Okay, so that's a little bit of evidence around the role of control and the way of reconceptualizing exposure. But that's not actually, as uh, control theorists, the, the therapeutic approach that we generally use. We use method of levels. Uh, as I said, Bill Powers started this off, but it wasn't used as a therapeutic approach until the 1990s by a chap called Tim Carey, who worked with Bill to develop this into a proper mental health intervention. It's applied to any problem and any mental health condition, and it's geared around helping the, guy, the, the client regain control of their lives and reduce distress. Clients book their own appointments. They choose the length of their session. They choose what to talk about. It gives the control right back over to the clients. Okay? We are just there to serve them. What do you do as a therapist? You ask them about the problem. And you keep on asking about the problem because you, it's the most important thing in your life in that moment while you're with the client is to just know and help find out more about the problem. So you're curious, you're asking all kinds of questions. And the other thing you're doing is you're asking about disruptions. And this is where awareness comes in. The idea that just given the opportunity to talk, we don't, won't necessarily be able to describe all the, 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 the intricate, perceptual, detailed elements and conflicts of why we've got an issue about something. And so the therapist is on the lookout for things on the surface that might mean that the person's got a background thought, a memory that just popped into their head, a, a view of this, of, oh, this is a bit silly, or a kind of a, a reconsideration of, of, of what they want. And so the therapist also says, it, was there something else that you were going to say? Or when you just moved your eyes over there, what, what, what happens? Or, you know, what's it sound like saying that to yourself? And, and when you just kind of smiled, what, what was that about? So we just keep that kind of curiosity going uh, with the client. Our job is to get the client to do as much work as possible on solving their problems um, and not get in the way of them doing it, but we're working the hardest we can to achieve it. Um, 
Here are the case series that Tim Carey has published. These, these have all been in very practical settings. He's worked uh, first in primary care settings and then in secondary care settings with very mixed groups of, of adult patients. And generally what we're finding is that people who do this, they fill in their measures of distress and their symptoms, they come back, um, uh, we rate this uh, often three months later after they've had it, however many sessions they want, and we get this uh, effect, a large effect size is over 0.8. So we get a large effect size of changes. Um, so we need to do these kind of studies where we compare against a control group, and uh, I've got a, a, a group of us that we work with in both uh, schools and, and also in secondary healthcare services where we're doing these kind of control studies as well. But these effect sizes are, are at least as big as the published changes in, in other services that you get in symptoms over, over time. So just looking at these, um, the amount of change, it's in the same ballpark, and Tim found that he had managed to achieve that level of change with a short number of sessions than in these other services. And so we've got a, a research team and contacts that, where we use this approach in very different settings, but we're particularly going for the settings where it's hard to do a traditional therapy that requires a diagnostic model, a fixed number of sessions, it requires a, a shared formulation. And so we're going in and doing this uh, in places like schools, inpatient wards, first episode psychosis, in prisons, on death row, in people vulnerable to radicalisation, in cancer treatments, in recurrent depression, and in people vulnerable to suicide. So we're going for the areas where other therapies really struggle to be so responsive and to, and to work around whatever the client wants. So for example, when my colleague Sarah works in an inpatient ward, she makes it a point of introducing herself to every patient as soon as they come in, and she says, just come and see me when you want, and you'll know the best time to come talk about stuff, um, and we'll just get talking. So she doesn't require any triaging or screening, she's just there to help them work on stuff. But it, some people have often asked, and curious, like, isn't this just what therapists do anyway? They're curious, they're asked, they ask questions, they're person-centred. So we were interested in that. So um, uh, a group of actually uh, students I work with, now led by uh, Vanessa McIntyre, we got um, best practice videos of a range of different psychological therapies, um, including person-centred therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, etc. And we used an establishing... Uh, system to code what the therapists were doing. And what we found is that actually what's good for all kinds of therapy, there were distinctive elements of, of most of the therapies, but MOL was more distinctive than the others, if you like, and it was distinctive in certain ways. It had more closed and open questions than any of the other therapies, and more questions about nonverbals, and that's kind of makes sense from what I said. But also, if you look at it, a lot lower on most other stuff. No interpretations, no self-disclosure, no deliberate silences, very little confrontation, very little uh, information, no approval or reassurance, no direct guidance, okay? And that fits, because we just want to hear stuff from the clients, and our job, our, our personalities are relevant for this, you know? our ideas about how we think the client's going to solve a problem is not going to change their brain. They're only going to do that for themselves. The other thing that was fascinating, given that when we've done this, you know, you, you listen to these sessions, the therapist is firing off questions every minute, every half a minute, because we're so fascinated in what that person's doing. You might think people find that intrusive or it might close them down, but actually what you find is that the client talks longer compared to the therapist and any of the other therapists we compared it to. And that makes sense, because our job is to help the client work it out for themselves and sustain that awareness on keeping their consciousness on the nature of the problem. So what else do we do? Because we kind of think this theory kind of works for us. We've got a manual that we've published called the Take Control Course, because, you know, you can do one-to-one -one therapy, but is it the most 
time efficient way of getting these ideas out there. The take control course is is for groups and it's a it's a kind of it's interactive and experiential, but it's also got information and worksheets and what have you. It's based just around these principles of PCT, control, conflict, and reorganization. And we work with people to help them use it in their everyday lives. We've used it in primary care settings, and we use a quite a fun version of this with film clips and, and art and music in high schools as well. And what we found in a, in a trial is that it's equivalent in its effects to the one-to-one the -one therapy that was being provided at that time to these, uh, to these uh, patients. Um, so that's really encouraging. It's something that we, we want to take forward. The other thing that we do to kind of increase the, the spread of this work is that we've got uh, a computer program that, even though it can't be curious because it's not got any goals of itself, it just searches the text of what you've written into it when you talk about problem, and it asks questions about the stuff in what you've said that's that's relevant to control and emotions and conflict, being in two minds, keeping getting you to elaborate on what we do, on what you're saying. Now, there's already evidence that something called expressive writing works, and that doesn't involve any form of interaction. The person just talks about their emotional conflicts. This is a way of scaffolding that with a conversation with, with the computer. Uh, and we found that that was um, perceived as helpful. It's, it was superior in, its, in, its, uh, in how helpful it's thought to be compared to a classic natural language program called ELISA. And we've shown that its effects are mediated by what we think should, it should be mediated by. Essentially, how much the person talks about goal conflict, being in two minds, struggling with different goals and different things they're trying to control in their lives. So... We work with a number of organisations to do this stuff. Um, University of Manchester, Nurture Psychology, um, which is actually my, my wife's uh, clinical psychology social enterprise in Rochdale, um, with the local trusts, with an um, adult primary care mental health service, with the local uh, other charities and the local museums. Most of the work we do is in uh, Greater Manchester, but then we've also got a few other bases in the UK. And as you can see, we're, 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 we've got a few focuses, particularly in Alice Springs, where Tim Carey is. These are some of the people that I've been talking about today. A lot of these people just go out there and just do method levels and just kind of get people sorted um, and working on their stuff. Others are researchers. Um, others are, are building some of these systems. Um, if you look at... PCT, it, it's, it's more than what I've just talked about today. Um, these are the areas that PCT has been used on and used with, which are, I think, very much the same stamping ground as cybernetics. And it's also a model of social or organisations and social systems. This is uh, Kent McClellan's model of how groups can get into conflict. And he did that by modelling two people in one group, two people in another group, kind of in conflict over some aspect of the environment. It could be land, you know, for example. And he's using this model that he actually showed that it fitted with observations on the grounds that sociologists had made. And it made predictions that more verbally described models just didn't, didn't make of the data. But, you know, I'm just... I probably set myself a few too, goals, too many goals in terms of where I want this to go, but... Luckily, back in Manchester, we've just got a, a, a team of people that are interested in this. And so we kind of, we look at an opportunity in, in various areas, um, in understanding early childhood, parenting, teaching, nature engagement, which we see as all connected and, and, and linked up, in um, employing uh, mental health first aid, crisis and trauma to kind of help someone get control in the moment, We've got a colleague who's got a huge expertise working with military veterans. Uh, Sara is going around the world training people at Mesta levels as part of a trial uh, to deliver it alongside actually what's called cyclocybin, um, which is a, um, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. And Mesta levels is being used to help people 
um, manage the effects of that to reorganize and, and resolve their, their issues when they've got long-standing depression. SARA has also used it to help people come to their own informed choice about use of medication. Um, we've, we've got views again to try and work this to help people uh, manage the ambivalence around substance use, uh, probation, co-counselling. We think you know, this is a, a way of talking about problems that isn't exclusive to health professionals. So people, service users, um, people with lived experience can use these forms of questions to help each other. Uh, we're going to be doing an accreditation system in Manchester and Sarah's going to be leading with that. I'm going to be working more and more with Tom to try and get these um, perspectives out there, not just again on an individual level, but at a, at a societal level through theatre. Um, and that helps because these models have been built with that and Martin will be talking to you about that later. Um, and also just back in the lab, testing these models like I showed you at the start and doing bigger, bigger scale trials. Um, so in summary, what I wanted to say is, you know, I'm well aware that cybernetics as a whole has set the stage, stage for many scientific advances and, and applications. Within that perceptual control theory, because of this essence of control of input, has been a perspective that certainly for me has transformed the research and application I've been involved with. And I do actually think that it has the potential for a society that actually understands the nature of purpose, just as Rosenbluth and, and Weiner wanted um, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Um, here's some stuff if you want to keep up with what we're doing. There's my Twitter handle, pctweb.org, which is the website, and my YouTube channel. So. Thanks again to Tom for asking me over to, to share this video and I look forward to some questions alongside Rick. So, uh, should I let you moderate who wants no, to? No, you do it. Yeah, oh, you do uh, it because uh, I'll be biased. Alright, we'll start here. Thank you for your talks. This was, let me just say, this was like absolutely fantastic. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Um, I have a question that goes to your talk, actually, about especially about the theoretical basis. So you talked about that the reference signal is coming from the higher levels, and then there are lower levels, and then the lower levels operate at a faster time scale than the higher levels. I'm not fully sure, but I'm seeing a tension there, right? Because on one, so on one side, it suggests to me, and this might be a misconstrual, it suggests to me that because it's coming from the higher level, it's conscious. You were making the point that a lot of it is procedural, so it's not conscious. Yeah. So that's one problem. Yeah, it's, it's not necessary to be conscious, is it's it? It's not necessary for it to be no. conscious. So right. they presumably come from a high level, but that can be unconscious too. So the second problem I, I think is a, to me is a bigger problem, and that is they seem there would be I presume a time lag of sorts if they are operating at different times. So if the kind of sensory motor faculties are operating at a much faster rate than the higher order ones, then I'm not so sure how the coordination of those faculties can keep on performing optimally if the signal that is coming from the higher levels are operating at a slower time scale. Yeah. There is a time lag, isn't there? But it's, uh... <clears throat> There's certainly a time lag in the nervous system, but you know there hasn't been much research done on this. And uh, one thing we ha I haven't done that's uh, Actually related to something I, that was being talked about last time, um, when we're controlling variables like ideologies that are defined over long periods of time, that's a different kind of control loop than any that an engineer has ever filled. A, a, a thermostat <laughs> controls temperature as it is right now. There's, you know, there's sure there's a little lag. Lags are, you know, they're interesting, but they're not. What's important is that, uh, uh, and how it relates to what we talked about last time is that there's got to be. Um, when I say different time scales, it's like the the whole uh, time scale of the loop at higher levels is longer much longer than the time scales of the lower level. And I don't know how that's implemented, but that means that what's present, what's now, when you're controlling an ideology or, or even just uh, 
to going out to lunch, <laughs> you know, something that happens over time, and you, so you don't know it's you're done until it's some t actual real time has elapsed. I mean, the time that we define in physics, I guess. Um, they're different. And uh, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to deal with it. We haven't done any research on it. But it's an interesting question for, that I think is related to yours. Consciousness is, uh, we just haven't done any work on that. I know for sure that consciousness and purpose are separate. Uh, I mean, I, because I've done all this research, and you know, it, it, and I know it experientially, and I know it from the, you know, the people can do it without consciousness. Just a point about the time lag. Um, my PhD student Max Park has been kind of building systems to kind of to test these things. And what we what we do is we build in a time lag into the because um, there is a time lag in in our brains and our bodies. And we you kind of you run the model and, and compare it to the data, and then you get to the time lag that actually in your model matches the human data the best. Okay. And then you look inside the model and see if that, that delay in the system is realistic or not. And what you find is it's, it's realistic. So, so actually, people are delayed in control, um, but only as delayed as, you, as, as you'd expect from the way that these uh, perceptual control systems work. So it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's, that's the I'm going to keep moving around here. So uh, I saw Gerald. And then Eve, and then Klaus, and then Art, <laughs> and then Ben. Michael Pile. We'll try and get all those in. We'll do our best. So keep them questions succinct and answers as succinct as possible. Gerald. Okay. Um, so I often come across complexity theorists working in strategy, and they're absolutely allergic to the word control. They say that the language of control creates a mental model that brings serious error. Then people try to take uh, micromanagement to control, which then uh, actually limits adaptability. And I just wanted you to speak a bit about how you would answer that criticism. I think I know, I know how I would, but I don't know how you would. Well, I mean, see, I think someone like. It, it's about how you control, whether that control calls, causes conflict with what other people want and need in their lives. So, someone like uh, Bill Gates. It's a fantastic controller because he does it because it works, because he doesn't get in the way of what other people need, and, and he can delegate, and he, what he wants fits with what other people want. Okay? Whereas someone like Trump, there say on video, maybe is not such a good controller because the things that he wants end up conflicting and really challenging the values and the ideals of what other people want. They're both controlling. One's controlling in a way that causes conflict, and one's controlling in a way that causes much less conflict. And you might, uh, you know, I try to point out good examples of control. We talk about pictures with good control. And, you know, control is something, you know, in certain contexts, the word sounds good, and in others it sounds bad. And yeah, I, the, yeah, patience of mine, it's just, if only I could get control of yeah. my life again. To them, it's a, a yearning to get control, and to, and to suggest that that's something that is not desirable for that person. <laughs> Does it, it's not right. Eve. Well, so is it anthropologists saying that should sit at the more anthropological and sociological uh, implications of this kind of model? One of the things, so it is hierarchical, and if the reference signals are all going like that. You know, the reference signals go down, and the perceptions go up yeah. simultaneously. Right, but the problem is, yeah, well, it's the going up part to me that's the problem when you get to the sociological level, because, you know, anthropologists and sociologists would say that the reference signals come from what you learn as a member of a social group, you know, whether it's a family, whether it's a community, et cetera. But, um, but then how do you change that? I mean, how do you change what the reference signal is? And um, Through experience. Mm -hmm. Through experience and interaction so that you learn. But, but there's so. this disconnect, is the model point. Well, out. so just take it back to, say, early parenting, OK? So a, a child, an infant, is born with a, a need, a desire to be close to their caregiver. And so attachment theory is, to some degree, a sort of subset of that. Yeah, so okay, well, I haven't finished. Sorry, I haven't finished explaining. Sorry, no, I can't. No, all right, can't answer. So, what, you know, <laughs> Sorry, I haven't finished explaining, so I, you can't really answer me something back again. 
Can I finish? Yeah. Okay. So that's what we call an intrinsic control, okay? Yeah. Now, the, 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 the child is working out what it needs to perceive in order to get that closeness to its caregiver, okay? So it's learning, right, if I can smell, smell them closer, and if I can see their eyes, and it's my mother's or my father's eyes, then I'm going to get that, that thing met. And that's the, these are the functions building up, and they're going up in levels until, they, until they're looking for a, a, you know, a sense of a kind of relationship that they're looking for in, in adulthood, for example. So you're building that stuff from within to meet your, your basic needs. That's the... Yeah. What about the stuff though that like, so is, is it inborn in the form of the group? How do you Well all that stuff's learnt. It's learnt. It's learnt because it meets your needs. I, I just quick yeah. yep. there are no reference signals going from one person to another. Yeah. The reference signals we're talking to are real neural signals. Um, yeah. if I tell you okay. to go somewhere that's not a reference signal. Yeah, so in, in Kent's example, all these references are in individual people's heads. But they're working together to get things done for themselves. We, we are we are going to have coffee break after this for further <laughs> elaboration. I want to get to some more folks. Klaus. That's a good picture to start. The controls are always, as we say, inside. Therapy is precisely changing the controls. If you let individuals control their own behavior, they'll never get out of that problem. The point is actually to open it up and change the controls and change the perception and make it make their life different. I agree with the last bit you said, but not the first bit. <laughs> oh. yeah. People can get themselves better, but you need to change the environment to make them to enable them to get themselves better. Oh, yeah, but where, how does the environment change then the control of the Believe control me, the environment that, that I provide, or well, a, a method level therapist provides them is very different to the typical environment in their household or with their friends. Art. Okay, so if I'm understanding the fundamental idea here, I want to see if I understand that idea. But the idea that behavior controls perception. No, no. That means... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Get to the script. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that implies to me that I'm speaking to generate errors. And You're speaking, speaking to I'm generate speaking. sounds well, that you hear. Yeah. And, and to bounce and I'm determining whether what's going on in my being is correct or not. Yeah. In some sense. Yeah. 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 As um, you sense it. Yeah. So, so uh, well, as an aside, that's one way to understand that people talk too much and don't listen enough because they have a higher need to generate errors. <laughs> um, I think it's but, wrong to think of it so, as generating so, error. So what kind of struck me in your present, so since I'm sort of understanding that bit, what struck me in the presentation, the Trick's presentation at first was something, Cloud, sort of Cloud had the impression that it was also a, a, a very all-encompassing theory and seems great, which really, it explains everything, I, I can walk away. Um, I didn't hear a lot of error, I didn't hear a lot of errors between you, I've heard a presentation of the really worked out theory. Uh, and I want to know where the errors are in this. In your, in your applying the whole theory back and on its own, that's what I'm interested in. Oh, you mean where, the, where we think are the gaps yes, in PCT? I think the biggest gap is that we don't know much about these functions, these input functions, like how I they convert. I, yeah, go on. I think I shouldn't have said that this explains everything. Yeah. It's a model. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Just, you know, it, it, in principle, I think I did put in principle. If if you ask me how does it account for the fact that I can remember things or whatever, I'd say okay, this is kind of how it does it. But we haven't tested those things. The only thing we've tested is the control aspect in terms of the fact that people can control different kinds of perceptions, and we know all that works, and we know it's a closed loop system where. People are controlling their inputs. But a lot of that stuff hasn't been done because nobody's... But but it's because it, it conflicts so much with the basic model of psychology, as I've tried to show you, because psychology looks at behavior as an output, mm -hmm. and they're looking at their whole... Uh, I come out of a research background, and you know I teach research methods of psychology, and I had to leave the field uh, teaching that. Uh, because I could not oh, teach uh, that anymore, because that's 
that's based on a, a model of a system as an input-output system, and it's just wrong. But so it's, it's fair to say I mean, that the input functions are something we don't know a lot about. Right, we don't know, does, certainly don't know how about How does the brain kind of code for things out there? Yeah, you know, we don't know that. that and a part of the reason to give kind of Bill his fair due is because he was kind of developing a kind of a, a, a universe, universal principles, then that's not part of that because each input function, each way that we extract and know that that's a chair, for example, is going to be u potentially unique to me and potentially unique to the thing that I'm trying to, trying to control in the environment. But I think we probably could do more to model that side of it. Mm -hmm. was, Mi was it Michael next? To or was it Ben? Ben, sorry, Ben, you're right. Uh, it was really noticeable that uh, the examples you talked things through with were at uh, individuals that <coughs> when there was more than one person in the video we talked about that in the lab. And, but you also made, particularly Warren, you made a couple of comments about bigger social questions and that mm -hmm. partly within this as a starting point. I guess the framing as an individual comes from uh, starting from perception. Is there a way in the next step that you might go on that you start to deal with how these things couple together? Or would you need to go to a different theory to cope with that? Well, I mean, yeah. I, mean, I did an extremely cool <laughs> <laughs> We have, and there's a discussion group on the net that deals with these things, and uh, one thing that came up was uh, um, pronunciation drift. How does how do people in different regions end up pronouncing things different? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a social phenomenon. And I, it turns out I was able to model it rather simply by assuming that individuals are trying to, when they talk to other individuals, they're trying to match the way they talk to the way the other people talk. And so, and so it, it, the people who are closest to each other mm -hmm. tend to end up as you go through several iterations, they come to pronounce things the same way. And that'll account, they, he's got data, we got data on regional differences in pronunciation. You can see how those develop and, and change using a kind of an evolutionary model where the, the evolution is happening because of differences in the, mm. the people who have, uh, who happen to be next to, near each other. Uh, so yes, I, I mean, in, again, in principle, the, uh, each, the models of uh, the individual you can put them together as many agents, uh, and uh, you can see emergent uh, social phenomena from it. It would like, be nice to have an example of that within the presentation. So well, we it, I guess it's because it's, yeah. well, it's also, it's not our particular expertise, although Martin will be talking about it later, but Kent McClelland is someone who's written most on, on this, if you're interested. Thanks. Michael. Okay, just to be, unfortunately, a little provocative. Sure. So, <laughs> We were expecting a lot of work. <laughs> My first observation has to do with your little video of the two hands, the elastic, and the dot. If you wish to actually have somebody guess it correctly, you need to change the perspective of the video to be from the person who's on the left. Your perspective is from overhead. Oh, yeah. It's clearly totally. third party observer base, and has, therefore it would be very difficult to draw a conclusion based on the person on the left so you did not show the perspective of the person on that, the left. That's kind of the point that's we're trying to make. <laughs> that's the point. It's an observer being observed. Actually, yeah. I, uh, when I, I was modeling that, I, I developed a little computer model to imitate that, and it was coming out wrong all the time. And I realized that I, I was taking the perspective of the film. But, and I was, I was putting in the reference for, for the location of the dot, you know, of the knot relative to the dot as seen from the perspective of the film, because that's what I had. I had the, the video, and I was looking at the video, and then I realized, wait, the guy's on the side. He's seeing something different. So, yeah. So uh, the model fitted better when Rick yeah. modeled it through the eyes of the person on the left, right. compared to from the front. Number two, why a hierarchy of models? Yeah. Hierarchy of? A hierarchy of perceptions. Why hierarchical systems? There's no need for anything that you said to, to impose hierarchy. There are other things that can be done with simultaneity and concurrence that do not require hierarchy, 
And quite frankly, I think hierarchy gets you away. Um, is, 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 is layers any different? Or? No, it's no. the entire notion that things are stacked. There's no reason that things have to be stacked. They can be concurrent and simultaneous in other relationships than hierarchical or layers. I think that's true as well, but I think, um, yeah, yeah, there is no way to do this without a hierarchy. And we've, and got, we've got some convergence with kind of neuro data on the hierarchical organization of brain right, systems, that, that, but, you know. The, the nervous system is uh, anatomically hierarchically structured, and also I yeah. just demonstrated one little evidence. And there's no similarity between them. Yeah, your evidence one, your little evidence one? Yeah. Okay, the problem, the problem with your evidence one is that it's biased toward hierarchy by the way you <laughs> did the uh, tests. If the signal had been derived from something separate from, the, from that which was the interaction between the two hands, and there needed to be a reaction to that signal, then you would not have been Absolutely able to not. anything with hierarchy. Of course at all. not. Right. Yeah. And that's true. But that's the, the branching but nature of the hierarchy. But you wouldn't have had the lower order system nested within the higher order system. Yeah. Again, you assumed the result in the design of the experiment. No. Well, no. The, the theory set up a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Of which, which was proved to be the case, but there could be other explanations of which is one that you've suggested. I'm actually also going to come to the hierarchy, but first, the, what I'd like to just look at when we have different dimensions of different groups coming together, the vocabulary is almost always different because mm. you follow the lineage of vocabulary. The shape, the form of the, the models have a lot of more commonness to it. For example, your model looks very much like the sensory motor coordination that Magrata was for. And all, both of those are essentially circular, where Magrata does not put a lot of emphasis into what goes through the medium, how the medium changes. And that's where I think the hierarchy model can be made more robust in the sense that it's the medium for each loop that you may look at, however you distinguish it. And of course, the model is a mm -hmm. model of how we think it is, mm -hmm. not the model of the world. And so it works, operates well with it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But anyway, if you have that, the each loop changing the context for the other one, knowing that that context is also being simultaneously being changed by other processes, yeah, yeah, yeah. then yeah. you get. That's just a limit of our drawing capabilities. Yes. That, so that is the way it would pan they're out. They're not nicely yeah. nested. They are interlocked. Yep. So trying to develop a simple linear like model like that is likely... Uh, it, yeah, it's not... not is that is actually. just to illustrate the names of the levels. It's actually a really kind of complex, branching, yeah. kind of root-like thing. They and so you, you, you are really larger. kind of getting to the, the bottom of what this would really look like in, in the brain. Yeah. Um, there's a wonderful video that... A uh, chap called Ted Cloak did uh, that's on YouTube where he's done it. He's got a kind of a, a dynamic um, movie of what of what this looks like, which I think goes some way to show the richness of what you're describing. Because some of them will start going in parallel, some will. Well, totally. Yeah, sorry, totally. Sorry. You, 